Hi, I'm Patrick Dunnikin. At Gibbons, we believe that citizens need to be informed about the complex issues that affect their lives. That's why we're proud to support the programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Bone health and joint replacement next on Caucus New Jersey. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by Virtua, South Jersey's comprehensive health care system, Sun National Bank, and by PSE&G, committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities. Welcome to Caucus New Jersey. I'm Steve Adubato. You know, joint replacement is more common than you think. Get this number. About 773,000 Americans have a hip or knee replaced each year. Joining us here in the studio to talk about this very important topic are Dr. Scott Schofit, orthopedic surgeon and medical director of Joint Replacement Services at Virtua, located in South Jersey. Michael Balaban had both knees replaced, one with traditional surgery and the other using, using minimally invasive technique that we'll talk about a little later. Dr. Andrea Johnson Davis, a physical therapist and clinical director at Star Physical Therapy down in Mount Laurel, New Jersey. And finally, he's been with us before, Dr. Elliot Rosenstein, director for the Institute or the Institute for Rheumatic and Autoimmune Disease at Overlook Medical Center. I want to thank all of you for joining us. Listen, we're talking about bone health, joint replacement. Uh, doctor, very complex, but one of the most interesting things is in your situation, right? You had two different, right? Two Both different knees. knees, yeah. One traditional, one minimally invasive. Correct. And minimally invasive could mean different things to different people, Correct. right? Let's break this down right away. Well, by the way, we don't just bring in, or, you, or we don't have guests bring in props like this without using them. This is very important. Take this doctor and sure. show us what traditional versus minimally invasive, and invasive having to do with the knee replacement. And this has big having to do with quadricep muscles, right? Correct. Talk Min to us. I think we have a shot of it, sure. right, guys? Minimally invasive can mean many things, a smaller skin incision and, and cutting less tissue. But what we're talking about is quadriceps sparing, the quadriceps being the biggest tendon in the body. And this is a knee joint. So when we replace a knee joint, we have to replace the aligning surface of the knee. And the only way to get in there is to get this kneecap out of the way. So traditionally, we'd split the tendon and flip the kneecap out of the way and then bend the knee back. That's traditional. That's traditional. Okay. And that gives you access to the knee to put the knee replacement in. But then you're rehabbing a knee replacement and a cut tendon. So theoretically, if you cannot cut the tendon. We'll go back for a second. That rehab, mm -hmm. on average, doctor, how long? Well, the entire recovery is about three months, but most people would say that when you don't cut the tendon, it speeds things about two to three times. Got it. Now you're going to switch gears, talk about what, some improvements here. Exactly. If you're not going to cut the tendon, then you need to be able to get this kneecap out of the way. And the way you would do that would be sequentially cutting bones. As the joint gets closer together, it relaxes the muscle so you can actually get the tendon out of the way. So the procedure becomes a very big part of getting a knee replacement in. But what you find is that postoperatively, not only the, is the patient moving better, but you're not trying to bend a tendon that was recently <clears throat> cut. So pain management is easier, physical therapy becomes easier, and the patients seem to do better. Point of clarification. Minimally invasive, as I said in the introduction, means different things to different people. Is that the same as laparoscopic surgery? No, laparoscopic surgery and arthroscopic surgery using fiber optic cameras to get into the joint. This is we're actually physically getting into the joint because we need to align these uh, prosthesis properly and put it in uh, the proper orientation to get the knee to function well. So you can do that by not cutting the tendon. So you get the same benefits from a mm -hmm. knee replacement, but hopefully, as, as uh, Michael will tell you, you can see a difference in the recovery. And if you can get somebody through the process faster and get them out in the workforce, L let's do that, quicker. by the way. And by the way, log on to our website. We'll link on to our partners down at Virtual. We're providing great information in this area. Let me ask you, when did you have, go back, which one's right, left? Right was traditional. Right traditional. Three years ago. Got it. A year ago, I had the minimally invasive surgery. Got it. The Describe left. the rehab on each. Uh, rehab on the first one was, was about a three-month process. Two months totally on the, on the first knee, totally devoted to physical therapy. Wasn't driving, was managing pain uh, with, you know, high, high doses of pain medication, 
uh, was going to physical therapy three times a week for two months. Doing it by the book. Doing it by and the book. And by the book. way, why did you need that re knee replacement? What, what's uh, your sport? I played basketball. <laughs> that for too long? Too long. <laughs> no, <laughs> too never long. too long. But. Too long. But, no, but, but also, you know, other activities and, uh, you know, arthritis in the knee. And I was, I was very knock-kneed as well. So I had a, What does that mean? That means that uh, if I couldn't put my feet together. My, knee, my okay. knees came together first. I couldn't put my feet together. Is that... You're verifying this, doctor? I'm verifying it's okay. true. It didn't <laughs> look good. It, it, it did not look good. Well, yeah. no, I mean... <laughs> How does it look now? They go together. Oh, that works. Now, talk about the other knee. Now, the the minimally other, invasive. That was a surgery that Dr. Shofet just Shofet described. Did. That's correct. That was the one that, that he first described. And uh, the minimally invasive surgery was a totally different experience. I was driving within two weeks. I went, went into the hospital at 6 o'clock in the morning. By 9.30 that day, I was walking and doing steps. By 6 p.m. that evening, I walked out of the hospital. Uh, and the difference was that, you know, I won't say that, I would, I would say that if you have a, a joint replaced, it's a year-long recovery no matter which joint it is. But? But your lifestyle and the change that is made by having the minimally invasive procedure not only jumpstarts you, but you also get to sort of a better place all throughout. Dr. More Davis, active. jump in. I'm sorry for interrupting. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yes. What are you hearing here? Typical? T uh, typical. It is typical. And knee replacement recovery period is, you know, it's surgery recovery, so it's uncomfortable. Um, traditional versus minimal invasive, are there differences? Well, sure, because the procedure itself is different. Um, you're replacing the joint in both knees. But what you have to worry about after the fact, post rehab, you can do a little bit more with the minimal invasive sooner. So, you know, what Michael's talking about is your quality of life comes back a little bit faster than it would. They're done for pain relief, mostly. Usually you have an arthritic knee mm. that's bothering you, it's limiting your activities, you know, really, really restricting your lifestyle. Doctor, who was a candidate? It's a good question. Um, one of the things that I think we need to address is what predisposes people to, to developing arthritis in the knee. And, and what we really have to do is define what we mean by arthritis. There, there are 120 different conditions that can cause joint pain. And for the most part, we're talking about two of the, the major conditions, one being osteoarthritis. 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 As osteoarthritis? Not osteoporosis, completely different condition. Go ahead. Osteoarthritis primarily being a, a biomechanical disturbance of the, the joint, contributed to by, by various mechanical considerations, in particular obesity being one of the, the risk factors, prior injury being another risk factor. And it's something that it's almost universal. Most of us get it to some extent or another as we get older. The other major type of arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, very different, autoimmune condition. The body's immune system makes a mistake and starts attacking its tissues inappropriately. Most patients who have this surgery are going to have osteoarthritis because we really don't have very good medications that can interfere with the, the osteoarthritic process. Dr. Shofit, as we get older and as people simply live longer, are we going to see more and more of this? Well, it, the uh, American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons actually looked at those numbers, and, and you quoted some of the knee replacements alone, 500,000 were done in 2005, and it's projected in 2030 to 3 million in the U.S. alone. Just by... Hold the, on, are you saying our numbers are wrong? No, you're not <laughs> correct. correct. No, we didn't. No, I did 773 hips. hips. 270 oh hips. My. Oh, I, could we do it again? Okay. 500,000 knees. 500,000 knees. 270,000 hips. Those were, oh. those were 2005 numbers. Got it. Dead on. You didn't miss a beat with that. It was Got perfect. It. <laughs> but, but, so, but knee replacements are more common than hips. And so what, knee more common. Knee is more common. And, um, and what we're seeing is not only the baby boomers, which are coming in, but of course we have all our athletes, all the athletics going on. All the injuries, the sports injuries occurring in the younger people are translating into osteoarthritic conditions or post-traumatic arthritis later on. So it's projected that that, that number is going to go up by s over 600 percent in 20 years. So you're talking about a huge volume and, of course, a shrinking health care dollar pool. You mm. know, how are we going to be able to do these procedures, quality outcomes, get the patients, get the patients out and, and do something that's going to change people's Let's lives? Let's talk about patient expectations because I had uh, shoulder surgery and a bicep tendon tear. And I had to get three different surgeries because it very simply didn't work. Uh, the first couple of times I should have come down to your place. Um, <laughs> but here's the thing. 
I remember the rehab, which was excruciating because, you know, it's and a great rehab operation <laughs> up in North Jersey where I am. But my expectations as to what I was going to be able to do and when, I began to, to see were very unrealistic. Let's talk about managing expectations. No, I mean, we actually just had that conversation uh, before we came here. In the green room, which isn't green, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> we did. Um, and exactly that, it, it really is managing expectations because the expectations of a 75-year-old versus uh, a much younger patient in their late 40s or early 50s are a little bit different. It's Should all they, be, uh, here's the thing. Mm -hmm. I kept thinking, and I, I, I don't mean to make this about me at all, because uh, <laughs> just make, which I'm capable of, but uh, just make it about anyone who says, I want to be tough, I want to be strong, I want to work through it. Not that simple? It's not that simple because, uh, again, we were discussing, um, the body only heals so fast. So regardless of what your mentality is going in, which is always beneficial if you're you know, educated properly and you understand what to expect, the body's only going to heal so fast. So I don't care if you want to just tough it out and you want to just do it, it's still only going to heal so fast. So you're still looking at a And, and your attitude, frame. I'm sorry for interrupting, describe mm -hmm. your attitude, Michael, because you're an athlete. Well. <clears throat> yes, but my <laughs> yes, but but, but once but 50 happens, but it's trust been a while, me. You know? <laughs> yeah, I, I get you. Um, no, but but I I was actually the one that brought up the conversation about expectations. Oh, it was you? Because I think that as a patient, you have to understand what's ahead of you. You need to understand that your what you're what you're getting involved with, what the commitment is that you're getting involved with, and you also have to understand that. You know, yeah, you, you're not going to get a magical pill that's going to fix everything all at once. So, you know, what you're really getting out of the, the procedure is the ability to get on with the rest of your life. And you don't, what you don't want to do is set yourself back mm. by rushing into physical therapy because, you know, hey, I feel so much better that I'm going to go out and I'm going to get on a stair stepper for four hours. That's not the thing to do. How much were you managing his expectations? Um, we try to manage expectations before surgery. And I actually asked him that question. You know, did I tell you enough before surgery? You know, to, to educate you. So you know, if they know what's coming and they know what to expect, it's, it's going to make the process much easier. But you also sometimes have to find patients you hold back. Because just because 10 is good doesn't mean 40 is better. And, when, and the body does need to heal, so physical therapy is, is crucial, patient education is crucial to get the patient through in the right time frame so they don't end up with tendonitis right. and, and a lot of inflammation. Timing. Doctor, help us on this. Someone watching right now, and listen, the purpose of this show very simply is to educate people, inform you so that if you're thinking about it, having, or you've dealt with it, or there's a loved one that you, you know should be dealing with this directly, that's why we're doing it. So the question is, say you want to go in to see a physician. What should you be asking if, you, if you're concerned about your hip, your knee, whatever it is, what kinds of questions? Yeah, the first question is to make sure that an accurate diagnosis is made because there are lots of conditions that can cause hip pain, lots, lots of conditions that can cause knee pain. They're, they're all not necessarily arthritis. They all don't necessarily need surgery. So accurate diagnosis, depending on what the diagnosis is, making sure that the appropriate therapy is instituted, which may include anti-inflammatory medic medications may include physical therapy, appropriate right. exercise, orthotic devices to correct some anatomic disturbance. We, we heard about the, the knock knees. Mm -hmm. uh, that can be helped sometimes with uh, inserts in, in the shoes. Uh, so um, the, the key is diagnosis and then a treatment plan appropriate for that diagnosis. Let's talk about men and women differences. Well, why do why you make that face when I said that? <laughs> of course that. there's differences, but it's, it's just interesting you said that because 50% um, of all hips are men, 50% women, but it's about two-thirds women for knees and one-third men. Because? Just interesting. There's a lot of becauses, and no one really quite knows the answer. What do you um, think? Um, a lot of it has to do with the anatomy, and um, there's some, uh, and it also it's thought that some of it's social, meaning that uh, a lot of men who are 55 or so in the workforce, 60 years old, or may have a bad knee and, and may not want to take the time to get it done. More women may not necessarily be in the workforce and have the availability. Uh, women are sustaining a lot more sports-related injuries because they're doing a lot more athletics and uh, you know Division One sports, and you're seeing a lot right. more anterior cruciate ligament injuries, which can then lead to arthritis. So there's a combination of reasons. Is part of it anatomic? Uh, is part of it social? 
Uh, the answer is not quite out there, but the data shows, and, and it's in my practice, is right. I'm like 65% women are knees and 35% men. Do you see any differences, and does the research bear out that there are any differences in terms of how men versus women deal with the rehab process? Um, it's, inter it's an, a very interesting question, actually. Um, I have interesting questions. I have no answers, <laughs> but I have interesting questions. Well, it's interesting in the fact that just in casual observations in the clinic and in my practice, um, both do very well. Women, for whatever reason, seem to do a little bit better with the, uh, the pain management aspects of it early on. Men recover faster, just in my humble opinion Is in that my right? practice, as far as returning to uh, activities and whatnot. Um, does the research support that? Not anything that I have read at this point. Okay. Can we talk prevention? And I'll tell you why. Well, I, no, seriously, one of the things that I realized, and, and I was, when I go to the gym, I happen to work with someone who uh, helps me with my lack of flexibility. I'll be, you know, I'll just put it out there. I don't stretch enough. I do not stretch enough. As much as I work out, I don't stretch enough. And I pay the price, you know, and I haven't paid the price to the degree that we're talking about with knees and hips or whatever, but the shoulder thing, and I don't know if it had anything to do with that. What is the role of being flexible enough and stretching enough before and after exercise. Exercise, first of all, is part of it. Mm -hmm. Dealing with the obesity issue, weight management, right? Was right. a risk factor. But go back to the issue of flexibility. Am I making too much of the stretching, doctor? Um, you may be making too much of the stretching, but the strengthening is, is crucial, because it's gonna- Give me an example. Uh, okay, you get, you get the knee replacement. Correct. Right, you get the knee replacement. Are you saying, I'm sorry for jumping so ahead. Post-surgery, we're talking after well, surgery or before? Well, okay, you know, do before. Okay. Are you telling me the more quadricep work someone does, the more work they're doing leg extensions, could you pull back a little bit, Steve? Camera, the more leg extension work mm -hmm. you do, okay? The stronger you get your quadriceps, mm -hmm. are you saying you're protecting your knee more? I'm saying it's gonna help with your pain management of your knee. What I like to, and this is my description, when I'm trying to describe arthritis, osteoarthritis, I describe it as the wear and tear, like wearing the tread off the tire of your car. Okay. All right, so we were born with our tread in our knee, and in time, you know, we're wearing it out. It's not being attacked in the autoimmune disorder. And but it's getting closer to bone on bone? getting closer to bone on bone. So when you're wearing that tread off, you can't exercise it back. You know, you can't in, in put a medicine in and, and inject it back. You can't take a pill and make it recover. But what you can do is, is manage the symptoms. So if you build up your strength, you can take more of the load off of the joint. So you're not, it's like taking a weight off of the car with a bad tire. Okay, it's not, it's not having right. to work as hard. So by strengthening that extremity, you can you know, uh, mitigate the pain. Now post-surgery, now what? Well, post-surgery, again, it becomes very important to get the strength back quickly, to get rid of, it helps manage the pain. Again, that's why not cutting the quadriceps tendon allows you to get your strength back quicker, okay. allows you to manage those symptoms and return to function. So, I'm sorry, so. Oh, that's okay, I was gonna say it is, is equally important post-operatively as pre-operatively. Now let's talk the hip thing. Hip thing, I know it's, a, <laughs> it's more than a hip thing. It's, is, is the hip surgery, A, more complicated than the knee? I know it depends upon the particular case. Um, in terms of, I'm thinking about what advancements are out there, and also is the rehab harder? Let, jump, anyone jump in here? There's you only know the knee thing, right? I only know the knee. Okay. It's, it's, it's an interesting. Good. Yeah, let's keep it that way. Okay. It's a comp well, the, the knee is as we described as a resurfacing, but a hip replacement is a ball and socket. That's a hinge joint. Works like a door hinge. The hip is a ball and socket joint. So again, the flexibility is completely different. So when you do a hip, you actually remove the ball, put a new ball in there, and a new socket. You don't have to have a hip hanging around, if do you? If you would have told me ahead of time, I would have come in with a whole no, hemi No, your thing pelvis. is primarily in right. Okay, you would have come yeah. with the, the whole, whole pelvis. Thing, the whole thing I would have had you, a cadaver and everything. But, go ahead. but Listen, this is PBS. For the sake of a small studio. Yeah, I we got a cheap out. budget, but right. go ahead. But you would have brought the whole thing. But it's interesting you point out that when you actually, you know, pull patients, and this, and this has been done, about does it feel like a more normal joint? How do you feel pre, right. you know, post-op as you do pre-op? Hips feel much more normal than knees. All right, and, and there's multiple factors. I mean, there's a lot more different parts. You know, uh, we do more ligament replacements, but interestingly enough, when you remove that ball on the socket, the hips feel more normal. People don't think that they have a hip replacement when they're done, but you can talk to a lot of patients who had knee replacements, and they actually, they feel better, they function better, but they don't forget about it sometimes. Now, the, maybe that's gonna change with, 
right. quadriceps sparing technique. Maybe it's going to change with the newer prostheses, but there's a definite difference in patient perception uh, postoperatively at this and point. Let's talk patient rehab with the hip. Go and go. No, I mean rehab, it's, it's different. There are restrictions following a total joint for a hip. There are restrictions in movement initially um, that can last anywhere from four to whatever the particular surgeon's what are you uh, doing? restrictions. You don't want to dislocate the hip. Okay, hold the, on. I ask mm -hmm. you what we're doing, and the first thing you say is what you don't want to do. <laughs> yeah. Right? Is that, that's important. It's very important, actually. Is that possible? That, that can happen? That absolutely can happen, and it does happen for patients that are not uh, cognitive enough to understand what their restrictions are, and that's one of the big things, first session in physical therapy that we go through. Do you know what you can't do? Let's not talk about what we can do. Let's talk about what we can't do. you got to go uh, real slow here. Mm -hmm. Jump in, doctor on this whole, the rehab piece of this, on the hip piece. From your experience, from what you've seen, um, is it that much more difficult and complicated? I'm not sure it's that much more difficult and, and complicated. It's just that there are other considerations, and, and the mechanics of the hip are completely different than the, the mechanics of the, the knee. By the way, what causes it? Again, uh, it, it is a, a wear and tear kind of process. It's something that tends to happen to us all to some extent. Tight arthritis again? I'm sorry? Tight arthritis? Osteoarthritis, so um, primary, co primary cause for, for hip replacement. Could it be autoimmune related issues? Uh, rheumatoid arthritis can affect the hip. Uh, there's a lot of overlap in the, the joint distribution, but most hip replacements are done for, for osteoarthritis. Interesting. Let me ask you something. Because I'm glad you didn't jump into the hip thing, because it's, <laughs> it's a nice place. Me too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> what advice would you have for someone watching right now? Because, again, the point of doing this show is to, is to inform and hopefully inspire people to get more information. That's why all the websites are up there. What would you say, Michael, to someone who says, geez, I mean, it's been two, three years. I, I, I'm having a hard time getting up the stairs. Forget about playing the three-on-three pickup game, right, basketball. Ah, nah, I'll let it go. I'll live with it, you say. They're watching right now. Well, I'll say you don't have to live with that pain. And it becomes an issue really about pain management. I think that that's, that's one of the key things that we should really talk about Go is ahead. pain management from start to finish with the whole procedure. Because, you know, I started in my early 40s. I'm on the other side of 50. I started in my early 40s managing knee pain managing knee pain in one knee and really eventually having it in both. I started with injections, I started with Vioxx, which was to me a wonder drug that went off the market. And then, you know, uh, once that really, once I got on the north side of 50, I couldn't manage the pain anymore. And, and right. there were things I physically couldn't do, couldn't mow the lawn anymore, couldn't walk for hours on hours. and. You know, I think that what you need to do is really discuss the issues with your doctor, what the alternatives are, and, and really get the, the most information you can. You said it starting out. What's the information you give them to get the information? And you don't want to live that way. I did not want to live that way. And, mm -hmm. and you know, I am back to a, a normal lifestyle, as I will, would call it, because I have both of my knees replaced. By the way, I always notice that once you hit 50, mm -hmm. you start calling it the north side of 50. I notice that. <laughs> I'm going to go with the same thing. Um, finally, doctor, mm -hmm. this whole question of someone saying, I'll live with it. Can someone convince themselves? I mean, is that what they're doing, convincing themselves that this is just the way it is, and they don't even know what it could be? Listen, I don't want to say it's a panacea. Science is changing all the time. The rehab is not easy. Let's let me make it clear to that, uh, on that. But you don't always have, not everyone has to be living with tremendous pain all the time. That's correct. There, there are people who come in, like you described, who you'll get an x-ray, you'll see severe arthritis, and they'll go, it doesn't hurt, it doesn't bother me. And by the way, real quick, sometimes people can be treated without surgery. I just want to be clear. But go there ahead, is a lot of treatment before surgery. Go ahead, I'm sorry. So we're talking at the end, but I'm glad you brought that up. But they'll come in, and, and they've reached the end stage, or they're having these right. issues, but they'll be saying it doesn't hurt, maybe it's stiff. And so what I'll do is I'll inject their joint, and I'll put in a long-acting Novocaine in there called Marcaine. And I'll say, well, walk around. And, you know, it numbs up the knee, kind of mimics a knee replacement. And they'll all of a sudden realize what it feels like mm -hmm. to have a knee that doesn't hurt. By the way, we'll keep talking. Uh, we've got about another 15 seconds. Okay. Thanks. 
15 seconds. I want to thank all of you for providing great information. You do the Novocaine, they're walking around. It mimics. It mimics the need. The pain disappears, and they realize that for 15, 10, 15 years, they've gotten so used to the pain, they forgot what it was like to have a pain-free knee. Isn't that something that could change their whole perspective? The preceding program has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 20 years of broadcast excellence. And 13 for WNET, NJTV, and WHYY. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by Virtua, South Jersey's comprehensive health care system, Sun National Bank, and by PSE&G, committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities. Promotional support provided by NJ Biz, All Business, All New Jersey, and The Star Ledger and NJ.com, Everything Jersey. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Caucus New Jersey has been produced in partnership with TriStar Studios. I'm John Campbell, Berkeley College, Class of 98, Associate's Degree in Paralegal Studies. I'm Busi Matsiko Andan, Berkeley College Class of 2004, Bachelor's Degree in Business Administration. Melvin Montalvo, Class of 91 and 2003, Degrees in Accounting and Management. Simi Papachin, Class of 2001, Bachelor's Degree in Business Administration. From different walks of life, our students succeed in different ways, yet their first step is exactly the same. Berkeley College. Don't miss Steve Adubato and co-host Raphael P. Rahman each week on New Jersey Capital Report. Airing on NJTV 13 and WHYY. Check your local listings.